Well, uh, Dr. Mark Wells, if you're a freshman, you might not have had a chance to meet him yet because he's been on sabbatical, but he's come off uh, his rest and relaxation, because we know that's what a sabbatical really is, just a vacation, right? <laughs> to come and share with us a bit of, uh, out of his passion for Soren Kierkegaard with a talk entitled, A Faith That Kicks You in the Teeth. Uh, he is our professor of philosophy and ethics. Uh, he left a career in the rap and hip-hop scene uh, known as Sly Fresh to come and teach uh, philosophy and ethics. Having previously taught at Sterling College, uh, he teaches here philosophy, ethics, uh, leadership, spiritual formation, and uh, loves to talk the theology of worship. Uh, again, he has been on sabbatical and, and will be in, uh, through the next semester, but uh, he's been using his time to continue his studies in Kierkegaard. He had his, got his BA from Friends University, his MAT from Fuller, and a PhD from Baylor in philosophy. He grew up in Seattle, Washington. He's married to Julie and is, with his two sons, Austin and Caleb, live here in the area. His interests are uh, interesting facts to know that uh, he both played soccer and danced in college. Is that, is that correct? That's right. And hopefully you'll hear more about that this morning. He, <laughs> no, you won't. Uh, is an avid kayaker and a an, uh, kayak instructor, uh, but he's here to help us brave the white waters of our faith. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Dr. Mark Wells. I think you've got to understand, it's a little loud, uh, that only half of what you hear is probably true or something like that. Um, I'd like to open with a prayer. It's a prayer of um, Henry Nouwen, and I thought it was appropriate. It's a very Kierkegaardian prayer, even though uh, you may not know who Kierkegaard is. You'll know a little bit about him after this. It's in a book that I'm going to uh, refer to a few times by Merrill Westfall called Kierkegaard's Concept of Faith. I was on a, a fellowship this summer at St. Olaf College where I was immersing myself in Kierkegaard studies, and this is one of the books that I read. And when I read it, I actually called or text, emailed David Taylor and said, hey, can I speak at chapel sometime because I want to talk about Kierkegaard's Concept of Faith. So a lot of, uh, or some of the material I'm going to cover this morning comes out of this book. Some comes out of Kierkegaard's own work, and a lot of it comes out of my own understanding of Kierkegaard. Um, but anyway, this is a prayer by Henry Now. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I am impressed by my own spiritual insights. I probably know more about prayer, meditation, and contemplation than most Christians do. I've read many books about the Christian life, and I've even written a few papers myself. Still, as impressed as I am, I am more impressed by the enormous abyss between my insights and my life. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. In Christ's name, amen. Well, how many of you have ever heard of Søren Kierkegaard before? Wow, more than I thought. I thought maybe one or two people would raise their hand. There's about five. Um, <laughs> well, I'm going to introduce you to Søren Kierkegaard this morning. Um, Søren Kierkegaard was a Danish... We're on slide two now. <laughs> Søren Kierkegaard was a Danish uh, philosopher, theologian, and he called himself actually a poet at one point, even though he didn't write any poetry poetry per se. He wrote parables, he spun some metaphors, and had some witty stories. Um, but he calls himself a poet. He was born in Copenhagen, Denmark in, on May 5th of 1813. He died at the age of 43, longer than he thought he would live, actually, by 13 years. He thought he would die by the time he was 30. And he thought there was a curse on his family. He died November 5th, or November 11th, 1854. So we're coming up on the 161st uh, uh, or anniversary of his death. His short life, though, left an indelible impact on the world as philosophers and theologians of the 20th century were shaped by, by his demand that we actually live the truth rather than just believing it. He was trained and educated as a, to be a pastor. Um, apparently, I didn't know this, but he's sometimes referred to as the Christian Socrates. I found this online. You can find some truth online. Um, but I, apparently, that's, he was the Danish Socrates or the Christian Socrates. I'd heard the Danish Socrates, but apparently someone calls him the Christian Socrates. Um, 
He was uh, trained as a pastor, but he never served in a church. In fact, um, he was sort of rebelling against the church of his day, trying to correct some of the problems with the church of his day. And if you lived in Denmark in the 19th century, there were a lot of problems with the church. What I found is that the Danish church, Danish Lutheran church in the 19th century has remarkably many of the same problems that we have in America in the church today and with Christianity today. And so he was uh, trying, to, uh, trying to correct some of those issues, and I think he still has something to say to us today. Um, a little bit about his social life. Uh, you didn't know it, but Kierkegaard was a Lakers fan. He likes to date uh, Kim Kardashian. This must be true, by the way, because I found it online. I found this picture online, so it must be true, right? Because everything you find online is true. Um, he did, he did, he was engaged at one point. He was single his whole life, was engaged at one point and broke the engagement. Um, there was a scandal surrounding him in several times, uh, several times of his life because he would, uh, he would write uh, editorials for the local paper and it would, it would stir people because he was arguing against uh, particularly a pastor named Martinson and another uh, philosopher, theologian named Heiberg and some other folks um, that were important in Denmark. And he was calling them out personally. And so he was, uh, he was sort of shunned and despised. He did have a limp that apparently he got at a young age. But because he had a limp, he immersed himself more in thinking and reading. And he was the best in his class in pretty much every subject. In fact, he, would, he bested his teachers on several occasions in witty debates where the teacher would come out looking like a fool. Now, none of you probably do that, at least not with your teacher. You probably do it behind their back with your friends. Um, which that happens. So, um, so how can I describe the work in a few short sentences, the work of Soren Kierkegaard? I think, this is my own opinion, a scholarly opinion perhaps, that there were six types of work that Kierkegaard had. First, he had a work of literary criticism. Uh, the concept of irony, which was actually his, uh, his thesis for his, uh, for his education, the concept of irony, um, he, he, uh, you, he studies irony in all its forms, and he really likes Socrates and Socratic irony, and compares all other irony and all other literature sort of to Socrates. One of the people he, he takes to task is a contemporary of his named Hans Christian Andersen. You may have heard of Hans Christian Andersen. He's probably the most famous uh, Danish storyteller. He was a contemporary of Kierkegaard. Uh, Kierkegaard, uh, he, he actually t rips... Hans Christian Andersen to shred and say, shreds and says he's a, he's a bad author. Um, Hans Christian Andersen, by the way, maybe, maybe the, his most famous short story is called The Little Mermaid, which is actually based on true events. Um, <laughs> no. There's a big statue in the harbor of The Little Mermaid, so it makes it look like this is a real thing. But no. Um, so he's a literary critic. He also has a cultural commentary, and particularly on current events, uh, at least three of his works, actually four of his works, deal with this. He has a book called Two Ages, in which he contrasts um, this age that we're in uh, well, with, with uh, the age to come. The book on Adler um, is about a specific individual named Adler, who, thought he, who, who claimed to be an apostle. And so he's arguing against the difference between a religious genius and an apostle, he says, you know, they, he can't really be an apostle. Anyway, he argues for that. The crisis and the crisis in the life of an actress is another one. Uh, and then the Corsair Affair, which is his sparring with the local newspaper. Um, he also has some philosophical works. And of course, this is what he's most known for, is his philosophical works. Either or, which is uh, uh, sort of a summary of the status of uh, philosophy in his day. Philosophical fragments. Um, a philosophical look at the gospel and, and how that works, uh, concluding unscientific postscript to the philosophical fragments. This is the PS to the philosophical fragments, which ironically is twice as long as the philosophical fragments. So his PS is twice as long as the, as the work. Um, and there's others as well. And then he has some Christian, what he calls uh, Christian psychological expositions, two of, wh two of them. One is called the concept of anxiety, sometimes called the concept of dread. The other one is called the sickness unto death. And I'll refer to the sickness unto death a little bit later. He has, and I would say this is the most overlooked, and yet probably uh, he's written more of these than anything else. And those are the Christian discourses. People think of 
Kierkegaard as a philosopher, and they don't think of him as a Christian author or a Christian writer, and yet if you counted the number of works he has that are called Christian discourses in compared to his other works, he has as many or more Christian discourses as he does any other kind of work, all of them put together. So he was a Christian author through and through, and people overlook that because they think about his existentialism or his philosophy or something like that. Um, I think, have I mentioned some of these up there? Yeah. Then he has uh, a couple of works, or at least one work, about his own work. He writes at the end of his life, uh, the point of view for my work as an author. And so even though his works didn't sell well and he wasn't a popular writer in his time, he looked back on his work and tried to explain what he meant. Tried to sort of critique his own work, uh, literary critique his own work and explain what he meant. And then, of course, in his journals and papers, which weren't published in his life but are published now, he explains a lot of his work. Kierkegaard is most well-known for his existentialism. So... I think Kierkegaard would love the Nike commercials today because of the motto, just do it. His existentialism was about living life, not about thinking about it, not about you know, um, pondering it, not about getting ideas about it, but actually doing it, just doing it, just living life. And so faith for him was not about thinking about faith or concepts of God or concepts of Jesus Christ, but it was about living it, about doing the Christian faith, about living it. And that's, that's really the emphasis of, of, uh, of existentialism is, is doing what you believe, living the truth, not just knowing it, but living it. And you'll see that through and through in Kierkegaard. Now, that gets taken a slight different direction in the 20th century with some of the existentialists. And so, Part of me says he's an existentialist. He's called the father of existentialism. Part of me says he's not an existentialist, at least not in the sense of the 20th century existentialists. So I, I debate with myself as to whether, call, whether to call him an existentialist. But I think he'd like to just do it, the Nike commercials. <clears throat> Kierkegaard's goals, he had uh, at least six goals that I'm going to talk about. One of his stated goals, he says in one of his journals, that his goal in life is to reintroduce Christ back into Christendom. He thought Christendom and Christianity had become about, had become about going to church, about your family, what your family is like, you know, what does your family believe, about everything, about the social aspects of hanging out with other Christians or whatever it might be. And he said that's not really what Christianity, Christianity has lost Christ somewhere in the midst of that. And so he wants to reintroduce Christ and not, not our idea of Christ, Christ, not uh, what we think of Christ, but the real Christ, the real Christ of the Bible. He want to, wants to reintroduce that guy back into Christianity because I think he's right here. And I want you to think about this. Sometimes we have a Christ of our own making. We have PC Christ. And that's not Patrick Connolly's Christ. That's politically correct Christ. We have a Christ that looks just like American culture, just look, looks just like, you know, our materialism or, or our consumerism or our whatever. We have a Christ that looks a lot like us, and we're comfortable with that Christ. But Kierkegaard says, I need to reintroduce the real Christ because people will be offended, and that's good. People should be offended by Christ, and I'll get to that later. They should be offended because Christ is so different and demands so much from us that we don't want to have to, uh, we don't have to, we don't have to change about ourselves, that we're, we have either one of two responses. We either respond in faith or we respond in offense to the real Christ. And he says, you might start out offended and then come to faith, but if you're not offended or if you don't come to faith, you don't, you're not looking at the real Christ. The real Christ will, will kick you in the teeth metaphorically. <laughs> um, he'll kick you in the teeth with his truth, with who he is, with what, what that requires to be like Christ, to be a Christian. Another one of his goals, is, uh, he summarizes this um, in his own words. He says, all of his works, maybe I'll read the quote. Well, maybe I won't. I'll take it too long. Um, he says that all of his works, in all of his works, he's trying to show what it means to become a Christian. What does it mean to become a Christian? 
And even Kierkegaard himself, late in his life, he was asked, he said, if in practice in Christianity, he says, if someone asked me if I was a Christian, I would say no, but I'm trying to become one. Because being a Christian wasn't easy. In fact, um, he says that, um, he says that uh, he wants to make Christianity, I think I'm skipping down here a little bit, he wants to make Christianity as hard as it really is. He wants to make being a Christian as hard as it really is. He says, most pastors want to tell you how easy it is to become a Christian. He says, I'm here to tell you, I'm here to to make Christianity as hard as it really is. As what does it require of us? When we say we're Christian, you know what Christian means, right? Christ-like? How many, raise your hand if you're Christ-like. I mean, I'm still, I'm still working on that. I'm still on my, on the road to that. It's still, it's still going on, so and I can't let up. You've got to keep going. So he wants to make Christianity as hard as it really is. He was a religious or Christian author from the beginning. Every one of his philosophical works, within a day or two of the publishing of that work, was also published Christian discourses that I think partnered with his philosophical work. So they gave a Christian, sort of, they, they reminded us that this philosophical work needs to be balanced with a spiritual work. Our work in life needs to be balanced with our spiritual life, with our spiritual work. So he was a Christian author from the beginning. He says that the climax of his work were his communion discourses. Um, He has three communion discourses, uh, and that should tell you something about what he thought being a Christian was, being in communion with Christ and with others. Relationship with God and with others was the most important thing, and we'll get to that Get to more of that a little bit later. <clears throat> he also describes the movement of, movement of his work as a catharsis or as an emptying. He says that I have to my I have to empty myself, empty myself, in order to be filled with Christ. There's an emptying that has to happen in the life in our life in our life as a Christian or our life in becoming a Christian. I thought this was also interesting, and you get this sense all through his work. He considers himself not an authority, but a fellow learner, a fellow reader who's struggling with how to become a Christian. And he's, you get the sense that he's reading his own work. As he's writing it, he's a reader with you. He, I think he, he, in some places, wants you to read it aloud because he wants it to be read to you as if you're the, you're the reader, you're the listener, you're the hearer. And he, he, he feels that way as well. Here's a quote on, um, from his journals in August 1835. He was 22 years old when he wrote this. I think some of you might be around that age. Um, this, this is what he realized. And I think a lot of us ask this type of question and seek this type of thing when we're around 20 to 22. He said, what I really lack is to be clear in my mind what I am to do, not what I am to know, except insofar as a certain understanding must precede every action. The thing is to understand myself, to see what God really wishes me to do. The thing is to find a truth which is true for me, to find the idea for which I can live and die. What would be the use of discovering so-called objective truth, of working through all the systems of philosophy and so construct a world in which I did not live, but only held up to the view of others? What good would it do, do me to be able to explain the meaning of Christianity if it had no deeper significance for me and for my life? What good would it do me if truth truth stood before me, cold and naked, not caring whether I recognized it or not, and producing in me a shudder of fear rather than trusting devotion? It must be taken up into my life, and that is what I recognize as the most important thing. So he felt his task was to find out who he was to understand what the truth is, but not just understand it, but to live it. Because for him, the truth wasn't true until we were living it. The truth, objectively, was of no use unless we took it into ourselves and were, and were um, subjectively living it out. So the truth, which he says, the truth which is true for me. Now that sounds like relativism, but it's not relativism. What he's saying is, Yes, there's objective truth out there, but it makes no difference until I take it as truth, until I take it into my life and live it as truth. That's what he's calling us to do, to live it out as truth. 
Well, there are some problems with formula Christianity, he recognizes, and I think we recognize these today. There's what I call, and this is, these are not his words, these are my words, but I, this is how I see, I read him. There's the one and done syndrome, or sometimes it's called the fire insurance view of Christianity. I say a prayer, Jesus comes into my heart, I don't have to do anything else. I'm good, I'm golden, I'm a Christian, whatever. Well, for Kierkegaard, be- becoming a Christian or being a Christian was a process. It was a, and this is his existential, you know, um, influence, I guess, but it's always a matter of becoming a Christian. It's not a one and done. You don't say a prayer and that's it. That's to cheapen grace. That's to cheapen faith. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's a constant living out of that. So yes, you say the prayer, you ask Jesus into your heart, however you want to phrase it, but you live it out then. It should change you. It should shape the way you think of things, the way you see things, the what you do, how you live, who you are. Second is uh, what Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace. And this is grace without discipleship. That's really what Bonhoeffer is talking about when he talks about cheap grace. Grace that we take and we say, well, God's forgiven me. I've got this grace going on, so I don't, you know, I don't need to actually listen and obey. I can just, uh, you know, God's going to forgive me anyway. But it's grace without discipleship. That's cheap grace. And when this is Bonhoeffer, I mean, uh, Kierkegaard says this as well, when grace or when faith is cheapened, it becomes worthless or worthless. <laughs> that is, when, when something becomes so cheap, we don't value it anymore. We don't value what is cheap, what is easily bought, what is easily gotten, we don't value it. If we have to work, if we have to do something, we have to, if we have to, um, and I'm, not, I'm not arguing for a works-based faith. That's not what I'm arguing. That's not what Kierkegaard argues. But when we do apply ourselves and we struggle, struggle and we strive for something, it becomes worth a lot more to us. When you work really hard for something and then you accomplish it, it becomes worth more to you. And so we're given this gift and now we should do something with it to show its value to show how valuable that gift is, to show how valuable that that grace is. And that's what he's talking about here. Um, Another is cultural Christianity. And I think this is, uh, I think I have it different on there perhaps than what I have in my notes. This is Christianity that caters to uh, the culture we live in. Cultural Christianity. He says, he he, uh, is hard on cultural Christianity. He thinks that's not really Christianity. If your Christianity means you look just like the culture you live in and it adapts itself all the time to the culture we live in continually, he says that, you know, you got to be careful about that kind of Christianity. He says, uh, Jesus teaches, at one point, he says this about the Danish church, about, about living in Denmark. I think maybe we could say, we could think about this, does it apply to America? He says, Jesus teaches that one must be born again to enter the kingdom. In the Denmark of my day, people people believe they must only be born Danish. Because when they were born Danish, they were uh, baptized. They were uh, baptized as infants. And that was the sign that they were brought into the church. And to be into the church was to be Christian. And so they thought, oh, I don't need to do much else. I can just live in my culture however I want. I mean, Danish Lutheran, Lutheranism is the Danish culture. And so I just live with that culture. Uh, and that's, that's good enough. Uh, but he's calling us to be different than our culture. I think Jesus seems to call us to be different than our culture and not just to succumb to or to give in to or to cave in to whatever social norms there might be. Whatever new thing, new politically correct, new cause, new idea, we have to check it out. We have to see, is that really, is that really Christian or is that American or whatever, whatever we want, whatever else we want to label it. Um, is it? Is it really Christian or is it our culture that's that's shaping our Christianity. <clears throat> Syncretistic Christianity is, uh, is, a, is when we accommodate other beliefs or religions into our Christianity. So we, it's the Christianity and fill in the blank. Um, my, unfortunately, my sisters, I have two sisters who are Christians, or at least say they are, but they're Christians and Buddhists, <laughs> or Christians and New Age, or Christians and something else. That is, what they lack what Kierkegaard would say is purity of heart. 
He says, purity of heart, he has a whole book, purity of heart is to will one thing. And when you're willing only God's will, that's purity of heart. When things other than God's will creep into your Christianity, and you're saying that's Christianity, is God's will and this other thing, or trying to conform God's will to your will, you ever do that? Well, God says this, but this is really what it means, so I can make, you know, make it fit with what I want. That's not purity of heart. Purity of heart is when we conform our will to God's will, not the other way around. And we're really good at that. We're really good at conforming, trying to conform God's will to our will. We we, we want this to be the case, and so we, 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 we maneuver God's will to be in line with our will somehow. We reread scripture, or we misread scripture, or we or we think, you know, we, we claim God is love, and so God loves us enough to want us to be able to do whatever we want, and so somehow we, we, we conform God's will to our will, and it should be the other way around. Purity of heart would be conforming our will to God's. And then there's uh, Christianity as truth, or objectively truth. That is, um, it's not, it's, it's true, we say Christianity is true, but it's not true for me. Uh, we say Christ, Jesus is a great teacher. Jesus is even the Savior or whatever, but we've never appropriated that into our lives. We think because we know about Jesus, because we know I can, I can uh, give all the theology, I can tell you about the incarnation, I believe in the Trinity, but the Trinity is an empty concept. It's, it's objectively true, but not subjectively true. It has made no difference in my life. That's another thing he's arguing against. I guess I skipped one, the conceptual Christianity. It's a more of a philosophical, uh, philosophical view. I want to get on to, though, Kierkegaard's understanding of Christian faith. <clears throat> In his, I'm going to look at three works specifically, and there's a whole bunch of things faith has I'm going to, I'm going to, that are mentioned here that I'm not going to talk about. I'm only going to highlight a few of these for the sake of... well, to a, a good closing at a, a regular time. Fear and Trembling um, is one of Kierkegaard's early works. Uh, some people think it's a work on ethics. Some say it's philosophy. Some say it's a Christian work. But um, in, in Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard is examining what it means to live a life of faith. That's primarily what he's looking at. He uses Abraham as an example. Abraham is the epitome of faith for Kierkegaard. And particularly the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, but then that extends to Abraham's whole life. So in the preface to Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard suggests that faith has been sold at such a bargain price that perhaps no one will find it worthwhile to buy. When faith becomes cheap, this is my own words now, everyone buys it, but no one cares for it. When faith is cheap, everyone buys it, but no one cares for it. Think about that for a minute. If you had to save up a long time to buy a Ferrari, would you value that Ferrari? Would you take care of it? Would you tend it? Would you wash it? Would you, you know, make sure there's no scratches? Would you let anyone else drive it? I'm not even sure I'd let anyone else drive it if I had a Ferrari. (laughs) I mean, I would be afraid. I know a guy who had a nice Corvette, and he wouldn't let anyone else touch it, let alone drive it. I don't even know if he let anyone ride in it. I think he just drove it himself. That was just a Corvette, you know, so you think about a Ferrari. But if you have to save up and buy it, and it's valuable, you take care of it. But if you're given a clunker, if faith is like a clunker that you just given to you, you know, you beat that up. I mean, I almost thought about, I almost thought about buying a clunker just so I'd have a car I could not care about, you know, and just beat up and use what for whatever. That's kind of like, he, he uses a different analogy, and I'm, I'm contemporizing the analogy, but um, that's like faith, you know. Do it, is it something we care for? Is it something we cherish? Is it something we work on, we value? If we value it, we'll, we'll care for it, and we'll, t- we'll take care of it, and we'll foster it. Whereas if it's a clunker, if it's cheap, if anyone can have it, if it's, too, it's so cheap, I mean, I do believe everyone can have faith. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if we give it away too cheaply, if it doesn't really, if there's no cost to it, if we haven't valued it, we haven't, we haven't worked on it, we haven't fostered it, we haven't developed it, um, then, then I think uh, it's, it's, we, it, we cheapen it. So we often value things based on what they cost. And so what has your faith cost you? Nothing? 
I mean, in a sense, faith doesn't cost anything. In another sense, it costs you your whole life, right? In one sense, anyone can come to faith. In another sense, it requires your life. It requires your life. So it's costly. It is costly. It's free, but it's costly. I mean, there's the paradox, right? Kierkegaard likes paradoxes, by the way. He said once, I just have to, I, this is one of my favorite quotes, so I just got to interject this. He said, the thinker without the paradox is like the lover without passion, a mediocre fellow. <laughs> so I, I like paradoxes. The paradox is faith is free, but it costs you everything. I mean, that's, think about that, chew on that for a little bit. <laughs> um, I think in our age, faith may have, may be, or may have already become so cheapened that it's become worthless to some. It's not valuable. Worthless, I mean, not valuable, not worth as, worth less than it was. Um, he struggles in fear and trembling to sink, to sink the false views of faith so that faith will regain its work. And so one of the things he comes up with as, as a, a faith as, and these are all faith as's, faith as the task of a lifetime. Um, it's practicing your Christianity through and through every day. Abraham's faith consistently refers him back to God. His whole life is a life that's con- consistently referred back to God. If you read the story of Abraham in Scripture, Gilbert Ryle, a uh, 20th century British philosopher, who probably none of you have heard of, <laughs> pretty famous, but if you haven't taken a philosophy class, you probably haven't heard of him. Gilbert Ryle, Ryle makes a distinction between what he calls task words and achievement words. So seeking and finding. Seeking is a task word, finding is an achievement word. Running and winning. Running is the task word, winning is the achievement word, right? Well, Kierkegaard seems to suggest that faith is a task word. That it's, it's a process, it's a continuing thing, a thing you're continuing to do your whole life long. That, it, it, that it's not an achievement word. In fact, if faith were an achievement, we could go beyond it, right? I'll check that one off. I got faith now, so I'm going to go beyond it and do some other things. But he says we never get beyond faith. We'll never get beyond faith. Faith is the task of our whole lifetime. We never have enough of it. It's never adequate. It's never complete. Faith is something we have to keep working on. We keep, it's a task of a lifetime. We don't arrive at faith and say, ah, got that one, you know, check that one off the list, done with that, don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, If our faith were achieved, God would be done with us. He wouldn't have any more to do, he wouldn't have any more things to work on or to do for, do with us. I would be sad. I, I kind of like God can continue to work on me. I know I haven't achieved faith, though. Maybe, maybe someone in here has. Maybe Jesus has. That's the only one I can think of. So what are the tasks of faith? Well, I'm going to outline two tasks of faith that are listed up here. One is faith as trust in divine promises. Kierkegaard says this in Fear and Trembling. By faith, Abraham immigrated from the land of his fathers and became an alien in the promised land. By faith, Abraham received the promise that in his seed all the generations of the earth would be blessed. Abraham became old, Sarah the object of mockery in the land, and yet he was God's chosen one and heir to the promise that in his seed all the generations of the earth would be blessed. He accepted the fulfillment of the promise, he accepted it in faith, and it happened according to the promise, according to his faith. Faith as trust in the promise. God has made us promises, and we need to trust those promises. And if you want to know what the promises are, read the Bible, but read it honestly. Don't read it and make up what it says. Read it for what it says. See what the promises really are. And faith, another task of faith, so faith is trust in divine promises. That's one task, a lifelong task of faith. And it was lifelong for Abraham. He didn't arrive one day and say, oh, okay, I've done all, I've, I've trusted in all the promises, now I'm done. Maybe when he died, he, that happened, but not before he died. He was continually trusting the promises all the way through. In fact, he had to because some of the promises weren't fulfilled in his lifetime. Some of the promises were for his future generations that came from him. And so he had to trust in that through his whole life, even to his death. 
Then faith is obedience to divine commands. And of course, uh, Abraham was given divine commands. We could talk about some of those, but I want to talk about two commands. In fact, the two most important commands that Jesus gave us. When Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, uh, what are the, what's the most important command? He gave this answer. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Those two divine commands. Let's think about those two divine commands in your life right now. I was challenged by this. I was reading, uh, John McLeod Campbell has a book called The Nature of the Atonement. One of some of the work I'm doing on my sabbaticals on the atonement. As I was reading, I was struck by this. He said, can we actually say that we're keeping either of those first two commands, those most important commands? Am I loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? If I really look deeply, am I always loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Or is this something I need to keep on doing, that I need to wake up every day? It's a task. You know, uh, trusting, I mean, I'm sorry, um, obe obeying divine commands. And even though those two, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, with everything you have, am I consistently every day in every way doing that? And am I loving my neighbor as myself? And I'll be the first to admit I'm not. And that convicted me when I was reading that. I think John McLeod Campbell, he kind of grabbed, kind of, the words just kind of reached in and grabbed my heart and said, you're, you're the man, you're not doing that. You are the man who's sinning, who's not keeping those commands. And I think if we're honest, that's why it's a task. It's a lifelong task because it has to be done every day. Kierkegaard has a book called Repetition and he talks about repeating, doing over and over again the things that we're supposed to do. Um, so <clears throat> we need to consistently love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as yourself. A couple other things in, in philosophical fragments and concluding unscientific postscript, um, which are philosophical works. Um, Kierkegaard talks about several other things, and, and they're all up there. But I'm going to focus in on uh, I'll focus in on two of these. I was trying to focus on seven things because seven is the number of completion. I don't know if we'll get to all of them or not. But uh, the th faith is the happy passion that overcomes offense. Um, in philosophical fragments. Kierkegaard suggests that faith, he, he, faith is a new organ. <laughs> like a, a, we think about, um, you know, our will and our heart and our mind and our uh, intellect and stuff. He says faith is like a new organ. It's a new organ that causes our lives to be constantly responsive to the teacher, which is Jesus Christ. He calls him the teacher. He's philosophical work, so he's alluding to Jesus by calling the teacher. Also calls him the God-man. So faith is a new organ that causes our lives to be constantly responsive to Jesus Christ, the God-man. So think about that. We have, when we accept Christ, we have this different capacity now to constantly refer back to Jesus Christ. And are we constantly referring back to Jesus Christ, or are we not? That's what it should cause us to do. That organ, that new organ, as he calls it. And then faith is the passion or appropriation of an objective uncertainty. This is kind of wordy. Um, here's a quote from uh, concluding unscientific postscript. <clears throat> he says, Kierkegaard says, it's easy to see that faith is not a knowledge. The follower, however, is in faith related to the teacher, Jesus Christ, in such a way that he or she is eternally occupied, uh, occupied with his, etern uh, his historical existence. So faith is not a knowledge, it's a preoccupation with the life of Jesus. It's a preoccupation with how Jesus is entering into history, into my history, and doing things right now, right here. Seeing Jesus working, consciousness of that, that's faith, that's part of faith. And it's a passionate appropriation of that. The word passion, um, the etymology of the word passion by the way, you guys know passion, right? You're passionate about something. You really, you know, the etymology of the word passion it relates to suffering. You're willing to suffer for something, right? It's from the Greek word pasco. It means to suffer. Um, and so we're passionate about Jesus so much so that we're willing to suffer. In fact, maybe we do suffer when we lack him. We, we suffer when he's not involved in what we're doing, 
And we might suffer um, because it's, you know, he has our best interest in mind, we do things wrong, but we might also suffer because we, we recognize our lack and our need. We recognize we're not as full, we're empty. So there's that passion that we have to have. And I think Kierkegaard, in fact, he thinks tr- passion trumps um, passion trumps philosophy or thinking or, or knowing. He thinks passion is more important than those things, to have a passion for things. I want to look now to the sickness and the death. This, um, a couple of things in sickness and the death. And this is, uh, by the way, if you want to read any Kierkegaard, I don't know, you may be sick of him, you may be tired, you may be sleeping right now. But if you want to read Kierkegaard, I would actually suggest that you read the start with the sickness unto death. Not because it's the easiest, but I think it's, it's pretty profound. In fact, um, I, my son, who's 15, I know he's probably going to grow up all weirded out, but I've given him philosophy texts to read ever since he was like 10 years old. I just recently, I said, you want to read some Kierkegaard? And he said, yeah. So he's reading the sickness unto death. That's what I'm starting him with. He's read halfway through it now in about a week, and he says it's pretty profound. And I said, is it making you depressed or, you know, despairing or something? And he said, no, it's actually, I'm, 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 he says, it's making me look at people and figure out what kind of despair they're in. <laughs> because it's about, it's diagnosing despair, di- diagnosing what, you know, how people are despairing, what kind of despair they're in. Um, but there's a formula of faith in sickness unto death, and it's very famous for Kierkegaardians. They all know it. You can quote it. They can quote it. But he says, faith is... That the self, in being itself and in willing to be itself, rests transparently in God. Faith is that the self, in being itself and in willing to be itself, rests rests transparently in God. We go around in this world, a lot of us, including myself, in despair. Uh, Despair, there's a couple different forms of despair. One is not wanting to be a self or not wanting to be myself. I want to be someone else, (laughs) right? I I don't, somehow I don't want to be a self or I don't want to be myself. I want to try to be someone else. The other is wanting to be a self. (laughs) That's another form of despair. I want to be a self, but I want to be a self of my own making. (laughs) I want to decide who I am. And I'm going to put on a front. I'm going to act a certain way. I'm going to wear certain clothes. I'm going to talk a certain way. And I'm going to be somebody and I want to be somebody, and I want to be recognized as somebody. And this is before other people. We're, we're trying to impress other people, or we're trying to escape other people, or we're trying to escape ourselves. The problem with all these forms of despair, and I'm, I'm simplifying, probably oversimplifying them. If you read the book, it's more profound than this. But the problem with all those is they're in reference to other people and to ourselves. They're with reference to other people and to ourselves. Kierkegaard seems to think that faith, and that's faith, by the way, is the opposite of despair. It's the solution to despair and the opposite of despair. The opposite of faith is not doubt. In fact, he thinks doubt may be healthy in some faith, but despair is the opposite of faith. The reason why is because faith puts us constantly in reference with reference to God, with who we are, with being ourselves, being who we're really made to be before God, rather than trying to be someone before other people or not be someone before other people, or not be someone in relation to ourself. Faith relates us to God. It, thinks, it, it, it helps us to understand what does God think about it? What does God see? How does God see us? Who are we as God sees us and not in the eyes of other people? And so that's what faith does. That's what he talks about. I wanted to talk briefly. Um, I was listening to some Kendrick Lamar this weekend. I thought I'd just mention this. Um, who was, was Joe? Joe in here? There's some, there's some guys who can testify to that. I really was listening to Kendrick Lamar this weekend, partly because he was mentioned last week in, in one of the... And I, I was listening to Kendrick Lamar to see what he might have to say, and Kendrick spoke to me. He spoke to me. This is what he said. He said, I got a swimming pool full of liquor. I'm going to dive in it. Got a pool full of liquor. I'm going to dive in it. So that spoke to me, and what it said is, with all due respect to the speakers this last week, this is a guy who's in despair. <laughs> um, and Kierkegaard, I thought about what would Kierkegaard say about this. I was looking for the truth in that, and I, didn't, I, I found despair instead. So 
And you may like Kendrick Lamar, and I may have just lost you right now because you go, oh, he doesn't like Lamar. You know, I'm not going to talk to him. I'm not going to listen anymore. But I think Kierkegaard would probably hear that, not as truth, but despair. Um, because, and I've listened to more than that song. I listened to a lot of a rap, a lot of, a lot of his rap, and I listened to other rap music too. And I just kept the hearing. I was listening, trying to hear what I could hear, and I heard a lot of despair. And maybe I'm just, I was just more tuned into that because I'm thinking about this, but I think God is the solution to despair, and faith is the solution to despair. It's the opposite of despair for Kierkegaard. God wants us to be healthy, but we either ignore it or we actively work against it. We have those two responses. I wanted to read, uh, this is a quote of Kierkegaard's, and it's re- or actually this is a quote of Merrill Westfall. And it relates Kierkegaard's work to psychology. A sickness under death, as I said, was a psycholog- psychological work. Westfall says this, from reading sick- and any psychology majors in here? No. Well, maybe I shouldn't read the quote. It, it actually deals, oh, I'll just, if you want to know about it, uh, talk to me afterwards. I don't see, I saw Brad Faircloth in here earlier, and I don't see him now, but, but um, maybe I can read the quote if you're a psychology major, because it does deal with um, P psychology and S psychology, and you know, it's kind of a little bit technical, but it does relate. Basically, it says that um, I'll, I'll try to break it down. Psychotherapists can learn from Kierkegaard about the spiritual nature of ourselves and the spiritual health. And he says pastoral counselors can learn from Kierkegaard about the psychological health because Kierkegaard addresses both, he doesn't just address just the psychology, or just the spiritual. He thinks they're tied. They're bound together. And we can't take one without the other. You have to think about both. That to be spiritually healthy is to be psychologically healthy. To be psychologically healthy is to be spiritually healthy. And that relates to faith, relating ourselves to God. How do we relate to God? <clears throat> so the last, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this. Faith is contemporary. Well, I'll, I'll mention this. So there's faith as contemporaneity with Christ without offense. Contemporaneity basically means recognize, recognizing Christ's presence in the world, Christ's presence in the world today. Where is Christ working? What is he doing? How can I join in? Who, who am I in relation to that? He says, uh, and I mentioned this before, from the possibility of offense, one turns either to offense or to faith. But one never comes to faith except from the possibility of offense. When you hear about Jesus, if you really understand what's being said, you're either offended or you would come to faith. The appropriate response to Jesus, if you hear him correctly, is not passivity or complacency. It's either offense or faith. And so, um, and I'm not going to read that quote, but you can read it yourself. I think it's an interesting quote. I can't but the idea, when you're talking to someone about Jesus, you know, some people get offended. That's actually better than them because then they understand they really get it. They get who Jesus is because he calls himself a rock of offense and a stone of stumbling. The real Jesus will either offend you or will draw you, draw you in. If you don't get offended or don't get drawn in, you're, you're complacent, you're passive, you're just, you're not really thinking. You don't really hear who Jesus is then. I think that's what Kierkegaard's point is. So do you, you know, do you, does, has Christ grabbed a hold of you? Or are you passively sort of, oh, that's all nice, you know, complacently saying, oh, yeah, I believe all that, but I'm not really going to act on it. I'm not going to do it. Jesus wants you to do it. He wants you to follow the Nike commercial, (laughs) you know, do it, live it. If you're not offended, and I would say offense is like you could be convicted of your sin or recognizing your despair. If you're not offended, then you probably haven't understood Jesus correctly. And if you, maybe the immediate response is, I'm offended, and then you say, wow, I need faith. Uh, that's, that's my story. I recognized I was a, sin, in a, a sinner in need of grace, in need of God, and then I came to Jesus because I realized it was offensive to me because he's pointing out, he's saying, well, you're not right with God. You need to be right with God. And then I had to come to faith, and I'm still coming to faith. I'm still becoming a Christian. I'm still... I'm still fulfilling that task. Um, 
The kind of faith that Jesus exhibits will kick you in the teeth and ask you whether you believe with your life and not your head. If you really believe with your life and not your head. I think we often misunderstand God's word to us in Jesus. And that quote is an example. I think uh, you know Christians are often cheap swindlers who don't want to understand the Bible, or we say we claim we don't understand it because we don't want to follow it. We don't want to do what it says. It would require something of us. And so either we don't understand it, or we, and part of not understanding is trying to figure out how to change what it really says to accommodate us. And we're intentionally not understanding it because it might require something of us. It might change us. It might shape us. The Word of God will shape us. We soften it in order to allow for our pet sins or to justify our personal desires, which are not often God's desires for you, your own personal desires. Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. And we have to recognize when they're not. We don't want faith to cost anything, so we misunderstand it, believe we can go on living as if we always have. But this is to cheapen faith and to make it worth less than it should be. If faith is a lifelong task, if it's trust in divine promises and obedience to divine commands, if faith is a lifelong passion, if it's being oneself before God and recognizing the presence of the living Christ, then it's harder than we think and requires us to change some things. But change is hard for us. Change is hard for us. We resist because we don't want to change because change is hard. But don't worry. Many times change brings about a better life and you can be sure that God has your best interest in mind. Live your faith. Take action. Just do it. I want to close with a quote from Sickness Unto Death. This is actually the um, epilogue to uh, Sickness Unto Death. He says he has this at the beginning. The greatest danger, that of losing oneself, can pass off in the world as quietly as if it were nothing. Every other loss, an arm, a leg, a wife, five dollars, is bound to be noticed. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for taking some of uh, Kierkegaard's deep and rich uh, concepts and bringing them down to a practical faith. Uh, let us close with a word of prayer. Almighty God, we ask for your help to live a real faith, to not just simply assent to the right beliefs, but to allow those beliefs to change what we do and who we are. Father, you make all things new. Make us new in our speech, in our action, in our love for others, and especially in our love for you. God, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.